Well, this is Dr. Grande. I'm making this video on August 3, 2021. A few moments ago, I hit 800,000 subscribers. I want to thank you so much. It really has been my honor and privilege to make videos, to produce this content about mental health and personality. It amazes me every time I reach these milestone videos. So again, thank you so much for your support. In today's video, I wanted to answer an older question that I was asked about my knowledge of vehicles and my preferences for vehicles. I talked a few times in videos about vehicles, like the topic comes up if it's like a true crime case and the offender or the victim was in a certain car or truck or SUV or whatever. And I think I've talked a few times as well about some of my mechanical experiences with vehicles. So I'll go through my list of top 10 vehicles that I've owned at one time or another in my life. Uh, a few of them I still have now, but most of them have come and gone. Before I get to that, I do want to talk a little bit about my philosophy of buying vehicles. I want to cover a few of the vehicles I've owned that have really not been favorites by any measure, and then I'll get to that list, that top 10. So as far as my philosophy, I have an interest in working on cars, like I've always been kind of mechanically inclined, and I've been fortunate enough to collect a lot of tools over the years, particularly in the last 10 years, but really the whole time I've been driving, I've been kind of building up the tools I have, and if I get a new vehicle, if it needs any specialized tools, or if there's a certain job I have to do on it, I'll buy the tools for that and I'll just keep them. So I don't rent them or borrow them, I always just buy them, hoping someday I'll need them again, and often I do. So again, that's kind of resulted in me having a number of tools available. And this affects kind of my, my car ownership strategy. I like to buy older vehicles with low miles, even though I have purchased vehicles new. And I have purchased a few with high miles. Generally, that's my strategy. Generally, that's what I like to stick with. Now, that's a strategy that's economical when you can fix your own vehicle. But... If you can't, it might not be a good strategy. So that's not for everybody, that's just what I do. I'm also very focused on the deal, like to get a good bargain. And sometimes that's not always the best because you don't really get what you want. You get what you're able to get for cheap. But either way, that's affected my car ownership strategy through the years. I haven't always bought vehicles that were winners, but overall I've done okay. And if I bought one I didn't like, I usually sold it pretty quick. So there are a few vehicles that I won't be talking about because I bought them and then a few days, weeks, or months later sold them. I purchased a number from private individuals, but I've actually bought most from dealers. And that's probably the worst place to buy. But I was never really desperate in terms of like, I needed something right now. I was always able to walk away, which I do much of the time. And a lot of the time, the dealer will call you back, especially years ago. Maybe not so much anymore with the internet being kind of the way cars are bought and sold, but years ago it was pretty easy to go in and express an interest and kind of make an offer. If the dealer wasn't interested, walk away and they would be in touch. Uh, a few times I got really good deals doing that. Other times they don't call back, of course, and I would just move on. But either way, that kind of frames out my philosophy in terms of ownership. So I want to mention a few vehicles I've owned that have really not been too good for me. And some of the ones that are my favorite list actually aren't too good either, but they're still favorites. So a few that I was really disappointed with. I had, uh, when I was younger, actually it was the first car I ever owned. It was a Dodge Aries, basically a K car. Uh, I think it had a 2.2 liter four cylinder, something like that. Automatic transmission. It was a two-door, it was a coupe, and it was yellow, kind of an orangey yellow. Uh, not, a, uh, not a great car, but I was in high school and it did the job. Uh, and mechanically, it was a nightmare. In terms of performance, a lot of vehicles these days, you'll see like, it'll say like zero to 60 in seven seconds or 10 seconds, or if it's a sports car, maybe something like four and a half seconds. I think for the Aries, it really should be more like yes or no, right? Zero to 60, sure, someday it might get there. If you're going uphill, it wouldn't really, but on a level or going downhill, it could get to 60, but it wasn't going to 
break any land speed records. Another one I really didn't like, I had a 2003 Chevy S10. It was a vehicle I bought just because I got an incredible deal on it. Um, like, really good. And it's great that I did because it was a nightmare to maintain. Like, it just took so much work. Now, it wasn't maintained properly to begin with, and that was part of the problem, but also I just don't think it was made very well. It was a uh, 4x2, four-cylinder, automatic, extended cab. It was actually the uh, three-door. So instead of having like a quad cab, it just had on the driver's side this little extra door that opens up. It's a neat idea, but that was really the only cool feature of the vehicle. It did have a spray on bed liner, so that was nice too. The bed was always in good shape, but the rest of the truck was not. I did so much work to that truck. The brake line literally rusted through. I've only had that happen one time in all the cars I've owned for a brake line to literally rust through and leak brake fluid. Um, and several other brake lines weren't in good shape, if I remember right, but they weren't like rusted through. They just were rusted, like they had rust on them. And it was, I think, way early compared to when I owned it. I bought it in, I want to say like 2015, something like that. Again, 2003. So you wouldn't think that in 12 years it would rust that badly. I had to replace the shocks, brakes, air conditioning a few times. The uh, anti-lock braking system control module failed. I actually mailed it out to get it rebuilt instead of buying a new one, and the post office lost it. So it didn't have anti-lock brakes. Brakes still work without it, but they weren't anti-lock. It just had so many other problems that developed. It developed these strange noises that I could not locate, and usually I'm pretty good at finding those. I have different tools designed for that, and I just could not, I could not figure out what was going on. Sometimes the instrumentation lights would just turn off. Don't know why. <laughs> the fuses were fine. Everything else I checked was fine. One of the other things that happened with the S10 was the door pins actually wore out, like bushings, these pins and bushings. So it was on the driver's door. So I would open the door and the door would like sag. And when I tried to close it, it would scrape on the body. Now, I know these things fail from time to time, but I've never actually had door pins wear out. That was the first time that happened. So the S10 had a lot of firsts. So I took my uh, engine crane and I attached the door to it so it would stay up at the level with the hinges so I could just pull the pins out and the bushings and just kind of push the door away from the truck, replace the bushings and pull the hinges together and then put the pins in. There's this little spring in there as well. I had to get a spring compressor, like a special tool to put that back in, but what an adventure. So all that for a truck that wasn't fast, didn't get good fuel economy, even though it was a four cylinder and was just a four by two. So that truck was an adventure. Moving on to my 10 favorite vehicles. For number 10, I put my Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme Brom. I think it was a 1984. It was one of the early vehicles that I owned, um, maybe the fourth one or something. So I was still pretty young, probably around 19, something like that. So it was a good car. It was a 3.8 liter V6, of course, automatic. It was blue with a uh, small red pinstripe and a white pinstripe. Had wire wheels. I replaced them with other wheels. I didn't do too much work on that car and it ran for a long time. It was big enough to be like safe, but not big enough to be obnoxious. I would have larger obnoxious cars later on, but it was a pretty good vehicle. I ran it for quite some time and then eventually gave it to a family friend who ran it for many years and he didn't do any maintenance to it and it still ran for a few years. When it was done though, it was completely done. It was time to go to the junkyard, but good vehicle. So again, that's number 10. At number nine, I put my 1978 uh, Dodge D150. So this was a pickup truck, four by two with a short bed. It had a slant six, which is an inline six cylinder engine that's mounted at kind of an angle. That's why they call it a slant six. It's not a great motor. I mean, it's okay. A lot of people really like them. I found it to be kind of low on horsepower and it still did pretty poor fuel economy. So I didn't really see 
the advantage of it, but it had a unique sound, like when you would rev it up. The transmission was a three-speed on the column, so three on the tree, as they say, and it was the only vehicle I ever had like that. I had many manual transmissions, but that was the only one on the column. And I really liked that. The linkage was a little complex, and as it got even more worn out, it got tricky sometimes to get into second gear, but with the linkage being lubricated and maintained, it worked okay, and I ran it for a few years. It didn't have power steering. I think it may have had power brakes. It had power nothing else, like everything else was manual. I believe it had a radio, AM radio. That was pretty much the extent of the features on it. Uh, no air conditioning, of course. But I really liked that I ran it for a while. I used to haul stuff in. I never towed with it, but it was a good old truck. Um, when I bought it, it was green and rust color. Not like rust color paint, just rust. And over time, it became more rust and less green. Eventually, I sanded it and primered it and painted it black. But of course, I didn't know what I was doing. I was pretty young. This was even before the Oldsmobile. And the rust, of course, came back, and those old Dodge trucks really rusted quite a bit. So I got rid of that after a while, but that was a good truck, good memories of it. Had round headlights. It was a neat, it was a neat truck. Moving to number eight, this was a 1990 Grand Marquis. This was probably around 1994, 1995. So at this point, I had moved out, I bought my own house. I bought my own house when I was 21. So this would have been around when I was like 22 or 23 years old. I'd been in the house just a little while and bought the Grand Marquis. It was white with a kind of a fake white top, which was something that was pretty common with vehicles back then. It had the five liter V8 and of course the automatic and it was burgundy inside. It was a really nice car. I ran it for many years. I don't know when I sold it, but it would have been like the late nineties, I think. So I kept it for a while. I bought it with kind of high mileage, which was against my strategy. I think it was close to 90,000, which for a Mercury Grand Marquis is high mileage, and especially back then. The uh, engine failed and the transmission failed. I had remanufactured ones put in, and they ran for a long time. They were actually much better than the original in terms of the performance, and I really liked that car. I drove it all over the place for quite a while. Very comfortable, very nice riding. Suspension was not great around churns or anything, a car that big. Uh, it was kind of soft, but really much better than I would have thought, you know, based on some other larger vehicles, like a Caprice Classic station wagon that I once drove that had a very soft suspension. So that was number eight. Moving to number seven, I once had a 2012 370Z Nismo, gunmetal gray. So this has the naturally aspirated V6, 3.6 liter. It made 350 horsepower. It was really a good engine. It kind of sounded rough when it would run, even when it was in good shape, but it's quite powerful. Had a six speed manual transmission with the, I think it's called a synchro rev match. So when you're downshifting, you don't have to heel a toe. You just put it right in and it blips the throttle. Pretty neat. Now other manufacturers have that as well. It had a functional rear spoiler. It was just a Pretty cool car. I really liked the uh, Nismo. My complaint about it was that because it had a suspension really tuned for the track, it was a very rough rider. And I didn't want to swap out the suspension because I would be kind of degrading it. Like I'd be making it less valuable by doing that. So I ended up just running it that way for the whole time, just with the stock suspension, which again was very tight, very rough runner. Any type of uh, road with a lot of bumps on it or whatever, it, was, it wasn't it was fun. But it performed really well. I mean, it was a great car, but the uh, zero to 60 on it was, I think about four and a half to five seconds in second gear. So first to second, like most manual transmissions getting to 60. It was pretty good. I thought the car performed pretty well. The weight was 3,400 pounds, which was a little heavy, but it didn't have like a lot of aluminum or anything, or fiberglass or carbon fiber or anything like that, mostly steel. But again, good car. I don't really miss it because of the ride, but I do miss the performance. 
It was quick. So that was number seven. Moving to number six, this would be my 2007 Toyota Highlander Limited. This is a generation one first gen, but it's the last year of the first gen. So in theory, all the gremlins have been identified and eradicated, although it definitely still has some. It has the 3.3 liter transverse mounted V6. Um, the earlier engine was a three liter V6. There's really not much difference except for the size, but I like the larger engine. I've done a lot of work on the vehicle, all the brakes, control arms, ball joints. The steering rack was replaced right before I bought it. The timing belt and of course the water pump when I'm already in there doing all that anyway. I did the plugs and ignition coils, which in the transverse mount engine in there, you know, three of those cylinders are really easy to get to and three are a real challenge, the ones up near the engine cowl. And it's not really because of the engine cowl itself, it's because of all the junk that you have to take off. Some of the stuff mounted in there is just very tricky, very difficult to get off. I have a lot of specialized tools, a lot of different ratchets and box wrenches and sockets. It was still tough to get a couple of those fasteners loosened to get all that stuff out of there. But either way, uh, I did some other work to it as well, but in general, it's been a pretty good vehicle. It's fairly fuel efficient, I think around 17 miles to the gallon, which for me is pretty good. I've had a lot of vehicles with substantial size and high output engines and stuff. But yeah, I mean, it's pretty good and it's all wheel drive, not four wheel drive, but still does a pretty good job, comfortable and just a steady runner. One of those vehicles that I would feel pretty comfortable to take on a long trip. When I bought it, it had around 70,000 miles, which is pretty good, but it did spend some of its life in Brooklyn, New York. That's pretty rough driving conditions, a lot of stop and go and all that. And I think that's one of the reasons I got such a great deal on it and why it's had more mechanical problems than I would expect, especially with the suspension. You shouldn't have needed control arms and ball joints that early. That was number six, moving to number five. Here I would put my 2004 Ford Expedition. I had that for a while. I just sold it recently. It was an XLT. It was silver. It had a 4.6 liter V8, the modular, Ford's modular V8, and of course, automatic transmission. The Ford Expedition shares a lot of parts, like a tremendous number of parts with the Ford F-150, and some with the Ford F-250 because the suspension's heavier because it's an SUV. It had true 4x4, it had a sunroof. It was Pretty decent vehicle, like it served me well for a long time. It could haul a lot of weight without a problem, a lot of people. It had a good third row seat that was actually usable. So I enjoyed it. I did do a lot of work on it. It needed uh, spark plugs and ignition coils. It had to get new brakes all the way around. So I did that myself, including the rotors and the little brake parts that no one ever changes. I buy those kits and just do everything. I had to put new tires on it. I put a backup camera in it, which I installed myself. I don't like the wireless ones, so I had to take down a lot of the upholstery and run the wire, and it was kind of a big adventure. But it was a good vehicle. It had some other little problems here and there, but nothing really significant. I mean, oil changes and all that's expected. Really nothing special. It was a good vehicle. It didn't have a lot of power. 4.6 liter V8 is definitely too small for it. And the fuel economy was abysmal. I think I did around 13 miles to the gallon, 12, 13. It was pretty bad. That was one of the main reasons it didn't make sense to keep it. It was just very expensive to operate. And again, kind of being underpowered, I really couldn't tow anything with it. So speaking of towing power, I'll move to number four on my list. This is a vehicle I still have, 2005 Ram 1500. Dodge Ram, true 4x4, a Hemi, a V8, of course an automatic transmission, it's a quad cab. I've towed a trailer with it, it has a lot of power. It's a pretty good vehicle, I haven't really done too much to it. It needed a transmission sensor, it needed a steering rack that I did. I also changed out the ball joints and the brakes on it. Outside of that, it really hasn't needed too much in the way of work. The air conditioning works, all the power features work. Uh, radio doesn't work anymore, but I don't really use that. So I'm pretty happy with it. It does have a pretty good amount of rust on it, which is not unusual for Dodges around that time. 
especially over the wheel wells and under all four of the doors. So every time I go out there, it seems like there's more rust on it. But I have seen Dodge trucks, and of course I've owned other Dodge trucks, including the one I mentioned, that have so much rust, it's unbelievable, yet they still run. They still move down the road. So I really can't complain too much. It's really not there to win a beauty contest. So overall, I'm pretty happy with it. It's a banged up work truck, but it does the job. And I think if I ever had like a really nice pickup truck, I would still keep the Ram so I'd have a truck that can actually do work. Right? I don't want to get a nice truck all messed up, so just take out the Ram. It doesn't even have a bed liner or anything. Not a spray on, not a plastic one, just, just paint. Don't worry about it. So when I bought it, it was already kind of scratched up inside the bed, and I thought no sense spending money to try to catch up the maintenance, the care wasn't done, so I'm not really gonna worry about it. But yeah, I like it, it's a quick truck, and again, hasn't been too much money in terms of maintenance, and pretty much everything that's needed, I've been able to do myself. So, required very few specialized tools. I think the only specialized tool I bought for it was to change out the transmission sensor, and that's something you need for a lot of transmission sensors. That just happens to be the first one where I needed the actual specialized socket to remove it. So yeah, pretty good, pretty good vehicle. So that was number four. Now moving to number three. This was my 2007 BMW Z4 3.0 SI. It was triple black. So it was black exterior, black interior, and black convertible top. I really don't like BMWs <laughs> too much actually, but this particular BMW I did like. On the plus side, it was pretty quick, 255 brake horsepower from an inline six. Not as quick as other cars I've had, but it was just smooth power delivery, and I really love the sound of the inline six cylinders. Had a six-speed manual transmission. It was flawless, very well engineered. It was comfortable, had heated leather seats. The uh, top was perfect, like mechanically, it would just go down without any problems. I've had other vehicles in the past where the convertible top was like a big issue with all kinds of problems getting bound up and everything else. Nothing like that with the BMW. It handled perfectly. It was just an incredible vehicle. On the downside, uh, BMWs have a lot of little plastic components that are held together with little plastic clips, these little fasteners, all different types. And I'm familiar with these from other vehicles, but BMWs have a lot of them. I had to buy a lot of specialized little fasteners. And every time I would work on it, when I would remove the little fasteners, I felt like I would break a few. You know, so you have to go out and, again, buy a whole pack just to replace a couple. And it just became a lot of work with plastic and not a lot of work with actual metal. <laughs> so I didn't mind working on it. It was a little tight underneath, but that's the way all sports cars are. Under the hood, it wasn't too bad. The inline six was pretty easy to get to everything, but I don't know, it just wasn't a good match. I eventually kind of reached a phase where I didn't want sports cars anymore. I just wanted to have uh, pickup trucks and SUVs, which is where I am now. But for my age like and my health at the time, I think the Z4 was a good match. It was easy to get in and out of and pretty comfortable pretty good ride even though, again, it handled pretty well at the same time. So usually when a car has a good ride, the handling suffers, but the BMW didn't really have that problem. So that was number three. So now moving to number two on my list. This would be a truck I had a while ago. It was a 1996 Toyota Tacoma. It was tan. It was an extended cab. It had a five-speed manual transmission mated to a 2.7 liter inline four cylinder, which was longitudinally mounted, uh, four by four, true four by four. It was not fast, it was not fuel efficient, it was not free of any type of mechanical problems, but it was a great truck. It was very comfortable, especially considering the four by four, and it would just run all day. Like that truck just loved to run. It was one of the few vehicles I bought that had high mileage when I bought it. And I ran it for many more miles with some problems, but nothing really catastrophic. I had to change a fuel line, fuel filter, plugs, ignition coils, brakes, blower motor, 
a few small things here and there, really was a pretty great truck. I mean, it really did just keep running. And I think that if it had had the V6, the 3.4 liter V6, I probably would have kept it. But with that four cylinder again, like I felt like I didn't get much more fuel economy and yet it was underpowered. So I had a 1995 Tacoma as well. It was uh, a V6 with an automatic. Really what I wanted was the V6 with the manual. So I had both of those trucks, but neither one was really what I wanted. One of my sons drove the other Tacoma. So he drove the V6 and I drove the inline four cylinder. But yeah, a great truck. You could work in it all day, throw stuff in the back, didn't have to worry about it. Fixing it was pretty easy. I mean, I've had a lot of Toyotas, so I'm pretty familiar with them, but even outside of that, just everything about it was pretty simple and straightforward. Everything was pretty much easy to reach to work on it. That's the nice part about getting a smaller motor in a vehicle that can hold a larger motor. You get some extra room to work around the engine, but yeah, pretty good vehicle, and I put it number two. It's one of the few vehicles I really miss from time to time. So now moving to number one, my favorite vehicle, the vehicle that I like the most out of everything I've had. This would be my 2008 Lotus Elise, California edition. This was a very unusual vehicle. It's a low cost Lotus. It's not like one of the more expensive ones like the old Esprit or the Evora, but I really like the Elise. On the plus side, it was extremely light. It was 2,000 pounds, and it was extremely fast. It handled brilliantly. It handled better than anything I've ever driven. It really was like a go-kart, like it was incredible. It had a 1.8 liter four-cylinder, the same engine we see in a Celica GT, so it's a Toyota motor, a 2ZZ if I remember right, and it had a six-speed transmission, also one that was in the Celica GT except gear number six was lower in the Lotus. I think it's because they wanted the vehicle to be able to accomplish 150 miles an hour. So this brings me to the downside. Because of that six gear switch out, it didn't really have the low rev at high speeds. It was revving high at high speeds, like at 60 or 65, the motor was screaming. And it really gave me a headache, like it was quite annoying. If it had the six gear seen in the Celica GT, it would have been fine. But again, they did that for the speed. I didn't need the speed. I didn't drive the car that fast. So I didn't really like that part. Other downsides would really be mostly related to the size. It was very hard to get down into. It had a huge door sill. It took me about two weeks before I got good at getting in and out of it. Once you're in it, it was fine, but it was just difficult to get in there. There was no room for cargo. The trunk was small. I don't think I'd even call it a trunk. It was this little compartment. The battery was in the compartment as well. I mean, you could fit maybe a few books or something in it. That was about it. The way the trunk lid worked was also the engine compartment lid. So you'd open it up in the back, have the battery, this little trunk, and then you could reach some of the engine. You couldn't do a whole lot of maintenance that way. Which brings me to the other problem. In order to work on the motor or on the radiator in the front, because the radiator was in the front and the engine was in the back, you'd have to remove the clamshells. The vehicle had a front and rear clamshell. And it was a big procedure to get those off. And there's some weight behind them, you know, move them around. And you want to be careful with them as well because they're expensive to replace if they get damaged. So that was the downside. Uh, the size and kind of get in and out, and you couldn't really move anything but yourself and one other person. When I was sitting in the driver's seat, I could extend my right arm and touch the passenger door pretty easily. When there was a passenger in the vehicle, my shoulder would be touching there. It's like arms would be touching. So it was tight in there. It was a special, weird little, little car. Now, because of the axe I had when I was 17 that permanently disabled me, I'm careful about vehicles, like I like to get safe vehicles. The Lotus isn't unsafe, but just based on that 2,000 pounds, there's only so much that can be done. I mean, it had front airbags, had a great seatbelt, and it was built to be safe, but there was times like when I'd be in traffic, 
where I would look over at like, say something like a Chevrolet Suburban or an F-250. And I'm looking out my window at like the running board, right? So it made me think that if I was ever in a collision, if somebody ever hit me, it wouldn't be good for me. 2,000 pounds against five and 6,000 pound vehicles. So eventually I did sell the Lotus, but I think that's probably the vehicle I miss the most. If I still had it, I don't know if I could even really get in and out of it anymore, but it was uh, still one of my favorites. I don't like to keep vehicles that I can't actually drive or aren't comfortable to drive or get in and out of. So again, it had to, it had to go for a few reasons, I guess, but still, I think I miss it the most. In terms of future vehicles, like what would I buy going forward? Like, is there anything I would want? I'm pretty cheap. You know, again, I buy older vehicles with low miles, traditionally. I don't know, I think the current generation Land Cruiser, I really like. It'd be nice to have one of those someday. They're very pricey. I'd also be interested in an F-250 diesel, like a King Ranch, Lariat, something like that. Pretty safe, reasonably safe, large vehicle. Um, I like 4x4 trucks. I think if I had to choose between a Land Cruiser and an F-250 at the same price, I'd probably go with the F-250, probably. I think it would meet my needs a little better. It's better at towing and probably a little more practical just for my situation. But yeah, who knows? I mean, there's all kinds of vehicles out there and I'm always kind of paying attention to that. So who knows what I might get next? So anyway, those are my experiences, my top 10 favorite cars. I hope you found this to be interesting. Again, I want to thank you for helping me to reach 800,000 subscribers. It really is a privilege. Please check out my podcast if you have not already, Bella Grande Media. It is also on YouTube. There I have a few different shows along with my co-hosts. We cover different homicide, true crime cases. We look at kind of unusual cases like conspiracy theories and kind of odd and bizarre circumstances. And we're even thinking about having a podcast on there about movies, like giving our thoughts on movies, like an analysis. So it's pretty interesting. We record about a video a week, sometimes two videos a week, and they're long format. Like the last one we did was over two hours. So much different than what I do here on this channel, but you may find it interesting. Again, please check it out. See if it's something you would care to subscribe to. And uh, I'll keep making content for, of course, both channels. Please continue to put different ideas in the comments for videos. As I mentioned before, I collect all those ideas. I put them into different documents. And I look through them, and that's where I get the ideas for my videos. So it's very helpful to me, and it helps me to create videos that people are going to find interesting. So again, please continue with those comments. It's been very helpful to me. So I'll wrap up by saying thank you again. I really do appreciate your support. It really just keeps me going as I continue to research these topics and record videos. Thank you so much. I'll talk to you soon.